Hello, ladies and gentlemen and gentle people. This is Ethan Sawyer, the College Essay Guy, bringing you more ease, joy, and purpose into the college application process. This is the podcast where I interview folks from all parts of the college admissions world, friends, old friends, new friends, and hopefully future friends, and basically try and figure out how can I make this process easier for you, the listener, whether you're applying to college yourself or helping someone else apply. So this is the first of two podcasts with Ted Dorsey, who's also known as Tutor Ted. And uh, this is a guy who scored perfect scores on the ACT, the SAT, the PSAT, and he runs a really cool test prep company called what else? Tutor Ted. Now, in the second part of this episode, you're listening to part one right now. In the second part, he's going to walk you through how to improve your ACT score by two points in 20 minutes for real. But before we get to that, I thought it'd be really neat to first get to know the man behind the Tutor Ted moniker. And what better way to do that, I thought, than to actually guide him through some of the exercises that I use with my actual students when I'm helping them find their topics for their personal statement. And I chose to use this method because honestly, I don't know of a faster way to get to know somebody in a deep way. So how does that break down? Well, first we'll start with what I call vulnerability training, (laughs) and you'll see why in a second. And then I walk him through a distilled version of my essence, objects, and values exercise, which I talked about on podcast episode number 111, or which you can find on my website. And then I take him through my favorite exercise ever, which is called the feelings and needs exercise. Also, it's been known as the 20-minute therapy exercise. Why am I doing this? Two reasons. One, I just wanted you to get to know Ted on a, you know, like who he is before you hear him teaching you. But secondly, I wanted to kind of give a sneak peek into like, how do I approach this process with students? And I thought this would be a really cool way of, um, of doing both at the same time. I'll say more about part two. That's the practical part, improving your ACT score at the beginning of that episode. But for now, enjoy part one of this two-part episode with Ted Dorsey. Ted, welcome to the podcast. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So, um, and nervous to be here. Good. That good. Cause I just pitched to Ted what I'm actually inviting him into. And he didn't know this because I didn't know this, but let me set the scene for us. Um, Ted has so much knowledge. Uh, he's been teaching test prep for how many years? Um, well, since 2000 was my, the, when I first got started and full time since 2003. So 17 years worth of knowledge. And what, one of my favorite things about, your work is how practical it is and how mm. you know how how easy it is to go oh i learned that i can actually apply that like right away um but there's also some deep stuff that you've got and sure before we get into the practical because you know if folks have listened to the podcast before they know i'm into the practical but i wanted to i wanted y'all to just get to know ted a little bit on a human level and so this will be kind of a two-part podcast where part one is about getting to know ted but in this very particular way that i'll explain in a second and then part two is going to be the practical you know here are some tips that you can use in order to improve and i'll exp- we'll explain that when we get to it but in terms of just getting to know Ted, here's what I thought, and I just pitched this to him literally five minutes ago. <laughs> it's actually live on the on, on my podcast, so if you want to hear my honest response, you can listen to that. <laughs> yeah, we've just recorded a podcast for him where he's interviewing me, and I realized like midway through, I was like, oh, this would be cool, and he's like, uh, okay. <laughs> so here's the pitch. Here's what I pitched him, and he's, here's what he said he's down to do, is I'm basically going to walk Ted through... Um, three exercises, three simple exercises that anybody can do that will help you get to know somebody faster. So this is in part me just wanting to connect with Ted and getting to know him better live um, in front of you. And part of what these exercises do is is they work to inspire discoveries, like live discoveries. Mm. So that's really part of what I'm trying to do is just get to know him better. But two, you'll also get a chance to see how the essay process works. And if you're you know, listening along at home and taking notes, you can go through these exercises yourself and maybe learn something about yourself. So I've asked Ted if, and I'll ask you again, Ted, now on my podcast, are you down to uh, do some like college essay exercises with me? I think it'll be great. I think it'll be interesting. (laughs) I mean, I feel like it's going to be sort of a therapy session um, for the public, Um, but I'm into it. I'm into it. Yeah, I'm game. In the spirit of just sort of warming up, um, because... It's, it's It can be tough to just kind of dive right in. I wanted to play a little one-minute game called uh, I Love. And the way this game goes is, and actually, I'll just go first. It's, and we, I'm just going to make a list of stuff that I love. Yeah. And it's going to take a minute, and then uh, I'll do it, and then I'll let you go. So, okay. so I'm setting a minute timer on my phone, and here goes. 
I love uh, air conditioning. I love um, walking barefoot through my house. I love um, mint chocolate chip ice cream. Mm. I love um, connecting with somebody. I love big questions. I love scary questions. I love um, um, I love having clean hands. Mm. I love my grandmother's hands. Mm. I love um, the smell of the air, the mountain air in North Carolina mm. where my grandmother lives. I love going on a plane. I love stepping on that, um, like the jetway, the you know between the airport and the plane. I love um, when the Wi-Fi on the plane works. <laughs> I love Louis C.K.'s jokes about Wi-Fi on the plane and how we've become so accustomed to that. I love laughing. I love deep belly laughs that make me cry. I love you know crying when I'm laughing. Um, I love good long conversations with friends that you know, where we just totally lose track of time. I love losing track of time. Hmm. I love... Um, Speaking of losing track of time. Boom. Think, uh, yeah. There it is. That's great. So the only rule for this is to just, when you run out of stuff to say, just keep going. Yeah. Okay. Fair so enough. just... So free writing. Free writing, stream of consciousness, one minute. Ted, what do you love? Okay. I definitely love baseball. I love the Dodgers. I love the color blue. Um, I love the color green. I love... Uh, beautiful eyes. Um, I love smiles. I love smiling from the eyes. Um, I love connecting with strangers via the eyes. Uh, I love walks. Um, I love getting just tired enough that I sleep really well at night. Um, I love a cool breeze when I'm sleeping. Mm. Um, I love a cool breeze and a warm human when I'm sleeping. Mm-hmm. Um, I love uh, I love the uh, uh, sleeping in in the morning. Uh, I I love uh, picking up a book in the morning uh, first thing. I love uh, thinking about writing and having fun ideas. Um, I love jokes. Um, I love oh. awesome. So that's an improv game. Hi. How did that go? It felt pretty good. It yeah, felt yeah. pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I, I probably. I mean. Yeah, it was good. I want, <laughs> yeah. I want another shot at it, but no, that was good. Yeah. So that's what we learned is that, you know, yeah. So, you know, and, and part I'm just learning, I'm just sort of seeing a collage of, of you. Mm. And I, I use this when I'm starting off either a workshop or one-on-one student just to kind of get the collage of you and just to get things flowing a little bit. Yeah. Um, free writing, like you said, and we're just kind of free writing live. And um, the next exercise that I like, and, and, and this is, again, a really short one, but it, it involves the prompt, if you really knew me, Mm. And I'll go first again. And it basically just involves sharing something with you that feels personal, that feels like, um, you know, I'm, I'm basically thinking of it as a potluck. And I'm, this is my dish. And mm. here's what I'm trying to bring, some part of myself. When I run out of something to say, I'm going to ask myself the question, so what? And see if I can go just a little bit deeper. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and the purpose of this exercise is just to allow myself to be known by you. Okay. Okay. So... Uh, Ted, if you really knew me, um, and I'm going to pause for a second because I haven't planned this out. Mm. If you really knew me, you would know that um, I sometimes talk too fast. And so what? I think this has something to do with just being an enthusiastic, passionate person. Mm. But I think there's a darker side to it where there's like a, a not enoughness. Mm-hmm. Like worried that there's not enough space for me or something in the world, mm-hmm. which is crazy, which I have no reason to believe uh, intellectually. But there's just this part of me that wonders, why can't I just slow down and just be so, okay, so what? So, what? so I'm noticing I'm judging myself for that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, yeah. And I'm noticing this is connected to like my inner critic voice, which, which in some ways really serves me and which some ways um, holds me back. So what? Um, so if, I don't know, sharing this with you, I feel a little bit more at ease. I feel, and I see you, I saw you nodding. So I'm feeling a little more connected to you because I'm making up that you have an inner critic as well. <laughs> um, you're laughing. So I'm making you th- making up that that's, that's true. Um, so what? So I don't know. I, I guess I'd like to give a little gratitude to my inner critic this morning for <laughs> helping me get so much done and helping me talk so fast, even though I sometimes judge myself for doing so. Can I steal the inner critic for mine? <laughs> no, you can't. You have to come well, up. What no, else is I'm there? Kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, no. So, I mean, you do whatever you want, but basically, just begin with the prompt. If you really knew me, and then what? Ask yourself, so what? A few times, and mm-hmm. see what you can 
Discover Live. Jeez, jeez, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is so much heavier than I was expecting. I gotta be honest. Let's see. Um, Ethan, if you really knew me, uh, you would see that every decision I make, I make with um, an extreme level of vetting, that nothing, hmm. uh, not one thing I do is sort of casual, even when I sort of mean it to be, even when I know it should be casual. Hmm. Um, so what? I um, I think it's sometimes that can be sort of... Um, not quite paralyzing. I mean, well, I mean, at, at worst, it can get to that level, you know, mm-hmm. where it's like decision paralysis, essentially, because, you know, every little decision has to get, uh, you know, vetted to the extreme. And when, when I say every decision, I literally mean like picking the kind of tea I want to have mm-hmm. or, um, you know, what food I'm going to have at the the hot bar at Whole Foods for lunch. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what? Um, I think that <laughs> it's it's, you know, you could say it's a blessing and a curse, but it's just a part of who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, that I, I make, I want to make really careful decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was writing more, I would um, actually. It, this is not as much of a problem as it used to be. When I was a younger writer, um, I wouldn't write anything until it was great. Mm-hmm. You know, so like the very, basically, um, you know, my writing partner would write fifteen pages of which one was good. I would write one page of which one was good, mm-hmm. um, and it took a lot of pain and agony and staring up at the ceiling to get to that one page Mm -hmm. um because you know most of the time was spent in in action um so yeah so i I think i'm a um, a fraught decision maker um and it is it is who i am i mean i think um you know we're talking about inner critic and i think that's that applies here too where there's just a sense of um of of judgment of evaluation that's really quick and easy Mm -hmm. And I apply it to myself with, you know, reckless abandon, basically. So um, is that how to do it? Yeah, yeah, great. Mike, can I so watch you just sure. in a particular yeah, yeah. way? Um, you know what? I, I, I'll just do it theoretically because I don't. I think you've done a beautiful job, and I not that it's my job to say like, did you do it right or wrong? But and, and by the way, you don't have to. You don't have to sugarcoat <laughs> anything. You don't have to be nice to me. You know, I, I'm 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 ready for any <laughs> feedback. I really am. Well, I realized just as we were talking, I was going to ask you a question that, that you'd already answered, which was, and this is a counseling question, right? Like, what is the how has that served you? And you've answered that, which is you know, it's you've created some great stuff and you've created some great work and then what has been the cost of that right and you mentioned how it can sometimes be paralyzing yeah i mean it it slows things down to some extent you know i mean i I think um yeah i mean it's it gets really kind of rich in there because you know (laughs) um i okay so this this week i was reading the um princeton alumni weekly which actually comes out every month um which is confusing but I was reading about all the other, you know, Princeton alums and, the, and, and everyone who's featured in the magazine has just written a book or, you know, is just appointed, you know, to some high position. And, um, and I, was feel, I was comparing all of them to me and thinking about how, you know, accomplished they are and how, like, what a loser I am and, mm. you know, I haven't done anything. Um, and that's the kind of the downside is that there's this, you know, high, high filter for, you know, any, anything I do being of value because of that high right. critical voice. Um, so that, that kind of is the downside. Um, when I'm able to be a little bit more sunshiny, which, you know, 15% of the time I am, um, <laughs> I'm able to say like, you know what, actually, I'm, I, I do some really cool stuff yeah. too. So that, that's kind of the, the challenge that's built into that, I think awesome. for me. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, great. Um, I'm going to move on to another exercise. Great. Just to segue. So one exercise that I really love to start with students after we've done a little warm up as we have is to do this, what's called an essence object exercise. And so I'll just do this with you. We'll do like a, a three minute version. You know, normally it takes about 10 minutes, but, um, so I want you Ted to imagine a box and in this box is a set of essence objects. And what does that mean, you know? So, because it's a term that I made up. But Hmm. for me, one of my essence objects is this friendship bracelet that I'm wearing that just to describe it to you who are listening, it's blue and green. It's kind of frayed around the edges and it's a little bit dirty. Um, It's meaningful to me because my wife gave this to me. Mm. Um, She gives me a friendship bracelet on my birthday every year, actually. Mm. It's the only gift that she gives me. Wow. Yeah. And 
it's really cool to me because we'll we'll sit on this couch uh, or you know somewhere in this house, and after about nine or ten months, it wears off. So mm. she reweaves. It's like her cue to reweave a new one for me, mm. and she connect. She like ties this friendship bracelet back on me, mm. and I feel like we're remaking our connection. Mm. And it, she's absolutely my best friend. So that to me is even more meaningful than my wedding band that I'm also wearing. Mm -hmm. um, another essence object for me would be like barbecue sauce <laughs> because I just love barbecue sauce. I'm not even picky about what kind it is. Uh -huh, it could be yeah. Chick Fil A or like bar, you know. BK barbecue sauce, but it also reminds me of my grandmother who cooked with barbecue sauce, you know, from the South. Mm -hmm. There's a Bible that she gave me when I was seven that represents me being raised in the church, um, being a missionary kid, mm -hmm. moving around a lot, but the church and Wednesday night dinners was kind of a constant in my life. So I would just, mm -hmm. just a few examples, the church, the bracelet, the Bible, barbecue sauce yeah. are some of my essence objects. So Ted, give us, and I, I'm not even going to make you do a bunch, but maybe just one. What's, what's, and if you want to do a second one, you can. But what's what's an essence object for you? I have one that pops to mind right away, which is um, it's a stuffed stegosaurus that my Aunt Pat gave me. I think it was for my fourth birthday. Mm. Um, so this is, you know, 1982. Um, and apparently when I first got it, I actually didn't like it. Or, mm. or, or well, her, her perception of my response was that I was not fond of it. Mm. I, it was, it's made of denim, and I think it probably smelled like like fresh denim, you know, um, which as a four-year-old was just kind of like a weird, you know, <laughs> sensation. And right. um, my only recollection of it is how much I freaking love this thing. Mm -hmm. It's the only stuffed animal I carried with me through childhood and that I still have. You know, it's the only one I, I care about. Um, and the things I love about it, uh, you know, it's it's very well made, but also very personally made very you know it's got like it's my favorite colors and and even beyond that it's just it's it's a uh, it's handcrafted and really um clearly you know I, I don't even know how to say why i know that you just look at it and you can say oh like a human made this for another human yeah um and that that just has extreme value to me you awesome. know it means so much and i um yeah it's 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 in a box right now, which is interesting. It's in the basement. Um, we, uh, you know, the aesthetics, <laughs> the aesthetics of our house are like kind of, um, and they're not strict, but uh, there's there's not a specific place for the dinosaur right now. But right. I, as I'm thinking about it, I think I should pull that dinosaur out of that box. Cool action item. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I'm making up based on what you said is there was a moment when you were talking about it that it shifted to some potential metaphoric qualities. Yeah. The notion of uh, this thing being well-made, first yeah. of all, that someone put a lot of care into it. Yeah. And the, you, the way, the phrase that I love that you said was that a human made it for another human. Yeah. Which I'm projecting into you, your work, that that might be something that's important to you. That, that, may, that might be the most important thing to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Say more about that. How does that connect to your work? Man, um... I just, I'm just going to tell a story um, because that that's a story comes to mind. I had, I was telling someone who just started working for me about a particular student. It, it came up because we had another student who reminded me of this person and it was, it was a student from, it was from two years ago. Um, and gosh, I, uh, <laughs> I'm at, I'm at risk of getting emotional. So I'm going to try to um, tell uh -oh. the story. <laughs> that's allowed to happen there, Ted. This is a safe space. <laughs> Um, the student came to me and was really high achieving at a school that was sort of, um, a little more alternative, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't Harvard Westlake, which is sort of our most, uh, you know, academically rigorous, um, competitive school out here in LA. Um, sorry to all the rest of the schools who don't feel that way, but it totally is. Um, it, another school and she was a high flyer. She was also highly anxious, um, you know, to the point where it was, you know, a little bit, a little bit debilitating for her. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, she had a hard time tolerating, um, not being as good at things as she wanted to be. And let me tell you that came through on her standardized tests because, mm -hmm. um, she could have a feeling and a response to an item, a question, um, that was, you know, intense. And if she got the question, it wasn't so much getting the question wrong, but not feeling like she knew what she was doing or not feeling kind of welcomed by the test. Um, and so it, it was just creating sort of an emotional avalanche, you know, within her. And so we worked really hard together. We put a lot of time in and um, developed a relationship, you know, and that was, you know, the, this perfectly like, you know, harmless and, and, and friendly relationship that I think, I know 
yielded a lot of benefits for her. And, and even, you know, in terms of the score, benefits beyond what we had expected or planned on. And I was so, um, I was just so moved by the fact that she was willing to kind of go there with me and like, you know, um, take my word for the fact that like she was better at this than she thought she was. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we, we went on a really great journey together and she came out the other side having absolutely killed it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the benefit is not just the, you know, the numbers are the obvious reason why we do test prep. Um, and there's a whole other side to it. Yeah. And to get to the numbers, the students often, um, changing how they think and hopefully in a really in a way that's really useful to them. Yeah. And I think for her this was. So yeah, I actually I got through that pretty well without <laughs> <laughs> I was I, I was I basically had to like kick my employee out of the room when I was telling the story the last time because I just it was so intense for me. I just, mm-hmm. it's it um um anyway, I love I, I love that kid. I love what happened in our relationship. And I just uh you know that that's the sort of like you know, a human did this for another human, you know, like because they cared, because they cared. That's, that's like the, the nexus of it, you know, that like, I, I wanted her to succeed. I'm not responsible for her success. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was, I saw her and I saw that what I I saw that she needed something and I was willing to put some time and energy into thinking about how I could help her find that. So this is awesome. Because one of the things that I hear in this is like a drive towards deeper values and one of the things, and this is, I'm segueing into the second exercise that I like to do with students and that I'm going to ask you to do is to consider what some mm. of your core values are. Mm. And so normally I would spend about five or eight minutes on this, but I'm going to just, we'll do a short version of it. And I'm uh, pulling up on my laptop here in front of Ted, I'm pulling up a list of values. Mm. And this is just, if you Google values exercise, you'll find this. Mm-hmm. But I want you to, Ted, maybe take a look at these and yeah. pick two or three of your core values. And yeah. you don't need to say what they represent yet, but I just, I'd be curious as you scan this and you yeah. can obviously <laughs> write something in. If, yeah. But what are what are some of your core values? And let's just leave it open. I'm not going to say even in relation to your work, mm. but just what are your some of your core values. Darn, this, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because there are some that I look at and I'm like, no, not interested, you know, and then many more that I'm like, oh, this is, they're either basically I can dismiss them or they're absolutely essential. So this is going to be tricky to pick a couple. Yeah. Um, Normally, as you're looking, I'll just riff for a second. What yeah. I'll have students do is I'll have them, and you don't even need to listen to me, Ted, I'll just talk to the listener. <laughs> I'll have them pick 10, and then after a few minutes, I'll say, okay, now let's make it a top five list. And they yeah. start to kind of groan, and then, okay, now let's get down to three. And so, I, I could spend all day on this. Yeah. I, I wouldn't. You're because you're, you're so intuitive and so great. <laughs> brains from making connections that it's easy for you to see connections. You'd probably want to check thirty of these. <laughs> but if you had to pick just a few this yeah. morning, and I'll and I'll lighten the pressure a little bit yeah. just for today. What what values are jumping out to you? Okay, curiosity, um, honesty, um, empathy. Um, I don't see creativity. I guess that yeah, I would throw that mm-hmm. in there. Um, what else? Um, um, gosh, I feel like, well, helping others, mm-hmm. um, compassion, those are kind of related. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's creativity. I just found it. Um, and if you had to pick, let's yeah. just say we had to whittle it down to like two or three yeah. just for today. Which ones are like front of mind for you today? Jeez. I'd say I, creativity really feels strong to me. Um, creativity slash curiosity. I don't know. I mean, those, those feel like they're overlapping for so me right now. Just yeah. Sure. I'd love to hear just about yeah. how that's manifesting in your life and your world right now. Um, well, I think it's about questions and asking big ass questions, you know, um, questions that you don't know where they're going and, 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 you know, being okay with not knowing the answer to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and trusting that if you put energy into it and if you just sort of keep asking the question that you'll get to an answer. Mm-hmm. Um, and is that something that you're doing in your life right now with yourself yeah. or give me, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he just laughed. It was really funny. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's relevant for me right now. Um, Wouldn't you say more about that? Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. whatever extent you're comfortable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do some, uh, like, traveling upcoming um and basically going to 
um, kind of leave behind the stability of coming home to the same bed every night. Basically, well, although we will have the same bed, we'll um, we're gonna be traveling out of a van for a while. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, and getting ready for that raises a lot of questions. Um, and the sort of like the weird thing is there's certainty in doing this and having this sort of like live from the road adventure. Um, that like that that. The hardest question is answered first, which is like, well, okay, so we're living from the road. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then all the sub questions that like lead up to that and like, well, how do you do that? What do you do? Um, get raised and what does this mean? And um, what's the nature of how you're going to interact with others while on mm-hmm. the road? Um, get raised. And so there's all those questions. And that's, that's the part where at times <laughs> it's almost like it's, it's, no, it, it's not almost like it is like solving a puzzle. Yeah. Um, and th- the beautiful thing about puzzles and an interesting thing that I think people don't realize is that you go into it knowing that you're not going to know the solution right away. Yeah. And that's the fun. And that's right. the weird thing about it is like, you know, solving a puzzle gives you a sense of satisfaction at the end of it. What leads you to that sense of satisfaction is not knowing the answer up right. until then. Um, so I, I think it's I think it's an interesting thing. I think it's an interesting like phenomenon. Like I said, curiosity, just being in a place of, huh, I wonder where this road leads. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Let's go explore it and see see uh if we discover something along the way. One of the things as you were talking, what I was making up in, yeah. in my mind was that there was something that led to this moment, something that led mm. to <laughs> a decision to, well, you know, therefore let's go on a trip let's let's take an adventure let's travel and so as we segue into the last exercise which normally takes about 20 minutes um, but we're going to do kind of like a five to eight minute version of it um i i want to kind of keep on this path of this what brought you to this decision to go on this trip and i want to ask so in, in the first part of this exercise it's six questions and the first question is was there something that was challenging to you in your life or that you were challenged by um that ultimately led to this decision? Yeah, I mean, if I'm gonna go be totally frank, it's probably growing up gay in the Midwest, you know, in the early 90s, um, in just a place where, you know, it was, no, it it was, it was pretty unfriendly. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, like you just didn't, you know, I got through high school and and I knew one, I had one friend who was a gay man and he was, you know, a great resource to me. And he was, he was a year younger than me and he was unafraid, but he, he wasn't out to the the school at large. He was out to his friends. Um, but it was very difficult to be, be yourself, you know? So I think that's probably part of the, yeah, adventuring spirit, you know? Give me some of the, this is the second question. What were some of the effects on you? of that challenge. And I don't mean, let me specify what I mean by effects. I don't mean necessarily the, the feelings because there were feelings. We'll talk about those in a minute, right, right. but what were the external impacts? How did your, how was your world different from my world growing up as you, you know, make up whatever that means yeah. to you. But, no, yeah. you know, for example, my parents got divorced. One of the effects of that was that my mom moved out. That's like a thing that right. happened. Yeah. So what were some of the effects or impacts on your life? I, the biggest one is like self-editing um, and and being sort of hyper self-conscious in order to not reveal that I was gay, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I went through elementary school just being my weird self, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, I, <laughs> I love myself and I love the fact that I'm kind of a weird guy, you know, it's like, I, I, you know, I I don't know how weird other people think I am, but I feel like I am. Um, and that's fine. You know, that, that's a great thing about me. I think at some point I started to like try to hone myself into a more kind of mainstream identity in order to be less discoverable. You know what I mean? And like, that's part of that is just junior high and how like miserable freaking junior high is. (laughs) Um, it's worse when you're gay, but, um, (laughs) at least in the nineties. Um, so yeah, so that, that was, and so like, Tuning up my self-editing capability, I think, was probably the you know the the biggest challenge there. Yeah. The next question, in terms of this, so we have the challenges and some of the effects of that. What I've heard you say so far, some of the effects was this. The, one of the main ones was this self-editing, not wanting to out yourself, not wanting yeah. to. You didn't say this, but like get caught. In some oh yeah, sense. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What were some of the feelings associated with this? And just so you guys know, I'm I'm bringing up a list. It's kind of hard to think of feelings, so I'm bringing up this list on <laughs> yeah. this screen of, of feelings and um, I'll share in the podcast notes where you can see the same list. I don't know if you know this, by the way, but uh, Matt, my husband and I wrote uh, some children's books about feelings oh, wow. where each of the characters are like these sort of 21st century anime characters who all represent an emotion. Cool. So, um, And one thing I've learned, and this is a great list, is that 
it's it's interesting to look at feelings and think about them in a sort of a nuanced way where you know each one has its particular um identity you know like they really are different and so i'm looking at this list right now and i think the first category that i'm going towards is scared Mm -hmm. within scared you've got apprehensive um is that dread for the one yeah Yeah. um uh you know panicky i was never i was never panicky about this i was definitely apprehensive um you know um, just sort of like reserved in a way Yeah. yeah yeah um at times sad you know you know, at times there was there was there was um like almost like a net effect yeah. of all the sort of you know work that was going into it just was like exhausting right you know um exhausted that's yeah. like another one yeah totally yeah that's that's a funny one that's <laughs> that's one of our characters i've always actually had an issue with it being a feeling but i, I guess it is a feeling isn't huh. it yeah let's see is it on the list that's not i don't know if it's on the list but i, it, I think it might be anyway yeah exhausted. <laughs> well there's tired yeah no there it is right there tired exhausted yeah, yeah. Next question. Yeah. Um, what nonviolent communication puts forth the idea that our feelings are deeply connected to our needs, uh-huh. that we feel a thing because we have an unmet need. So, what 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 do you feel like when you think about feeling scared or feeling nervous or mm. feeling exhausted? What were your needs? Hmm. Um, yeah. Well, um, I would say connection. Mm-hmm. You know, like a, a fear of being disconnected, a fear of being, um, you know, kind of kicked out of the pack. Because yeah. I, I think that, you know, <laughs> I used to do a lot of SAT work on the old SAT and, you know, vocabulary was always a huge part of that. So there's the word eccentric, um, which I think of myself as. Mm-hmm. And what it means is, you know, ec or X as in out of, and then centric as in the center. So basically like you're not in the center of the pack. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're completely um, divorced from the pack. You're just not in sort of in the center. You know, if there's this sort of like circle that represents humanity, you're towards the edge. Um, I think I was nervous about getting kicked out of the circle. Yeah. You know, yeah. not being welcomed at all. Yeah. What did you do to meet that need? This is the fifth question. So based on this need, this need to feel connected, yeah. to not be kicked out of the circle, right. what were some strategies that you developed? Either... Positive or negative. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think positively or, or negatively or both. I, um, you know, and this is true for every human, but I needed and wanted love. You know, yeah. I needed and wanted positive positive responses from people. Um, that if you're sort of on the edge and a little bit different than most, um, you know, from, you know, I have, I have a little bit of an, I think, offbeat sense of humor or sometimes dark sense of humor. And um, Is that one of the ways that you maybe... And so my question is, how did you get that need for love or that need for connection met? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, like that, to me, that sense of humor thing is just part of my identity. You know, like as a little kid, I remember like dark things just making me happy. You know what I mean? Like this is, okay, it's a random quick story. There was a, I had a dinosaur book. I was into dinosaurs when I was little. Um, And there was a picture of, um, what was it called? It was not a raptor, but it was, it was sort of in the raptor family. Dinonychus is what it was called. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was uh, shredding another dinosaur with its front claw. And like literally, this was the only graphic image in the book. And it wasn't even that graphic, but it had like sort of sliced open the belly of this other dinosaur. That was like the most interesting, craziest, coolest thing I'd ever seen. And I was like scared of it and attracted to it all. And I would, I would basically open the book just to look at that one particular Mm -hmm. image, you know? Um, so I think that that was like endemic, you know, Mm -hmm. the sort of like, um, appeal of the, of the dark side a little Mm -hmm. bit. Um, and I still feel that way. And I'm not, I'm definitely not a violent person, but I, I'm, I'm someone who like embraces seeing the good and bad of humanity. Um, so the, the challenge there is that that also is eccentric, right? Like, right. you know, you know, being gay is one thing, being, having a dark sense of humor is another thing. Um, and they're, and it's all fine. It's all, just, it's all just a little bit eccentric. And so I think I would show that to people and hope for their approval, hmm. you know? And so like basically be working at the edges of the circle and, but then kind of be looking towards the inner part of the circle and hoping that people were like, yeah, man, you know, go riff. That's cool. Right. Um, so it was, it's, it was like this weird, uh, not weird, but this joint, um, you know, exploration of outer boundaries and approval from right. those in the, in the middle. How else? I'm just curious, just in terms of what you were involved with, what you were doing, how else did you get that need for connection met? What else did you do or 
Yeah, but did you have any extracurricular activities to ask a really leading question? Yeah, and I did. I did. I mean, I, I, you know, I had like I was I was on the swim team, and I was um, uh, you know in choir and in theater, and you know, theater was probably the most where I connected with people the most. Mm. But even beyond that, I was it was my friendships. You yeah. know, just like, and you know, everyone has great friendships, but I had these, you know, deep intense friendships where we share as share as deeply as we possibly could. And that yeah. was the, uh, you know, that, that was where I was getting my sense of approval. Um, I didn't have, I don't think I had like a zillion friends. I just had, you know, 12 friends who mm-hmm. I still have, you yeah. know, um, with whom I could share everything. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like a, um, yeah, you know, like a safe space to share, I think is what I was, yeah. Did you feel like you found that a, a safe place, to, a safe space to definitely. share? Definitely. I definitely did. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I could, yeah. I'm thinking of all of those people out there right now. Yeah. <laughs> On to the last question. It's There are two questions at the end, but one of them is, what did you learn through... So what I've heard you say so far is there was this challenge growing up gay in the Midwest and feeling, having the self-editing impulse that sort of sometimes made you scared and sometimes made you feel... I don't know if you said this exactly these words, but like you didn't belong. Um, and the need where it was for connection and love. One of the ways you got this was through your friends, through, you mentioned theater, um, also through dark jokes, you know, yeah. and potentially finding some connection through that. Um, through, let's say, the theater and through the friends and through the um, the dark jokes, what did what did you learn? What are some of the, if, if I may, the values that you developed um, through this? And I'm hmm. going to scroll down to this values list. Um, and you've, you've mentioned some of them already. You mentioned empathy. Uh, you mentioned creativity. Mm. You know, these are some of the core values, but there may be some others that are coming up for you just as you've told this version of your story. Yeah, this is great. Um, geez, um, the ones, that, you know, your eye kind of goes to certain things. You know what I mean? Like your eye just sort of stops on the ones yeah. that resonate. Um, I would say, I mean, I'm just going to throw out all the ones that I see. Freedom was one. Oh, let's just stop right there. Yeah. Talking about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a powerful one. You know, that's a powerful one for me. And I think it's, um, it's going to be sort of a lifelong challenge to try to find mm. freedom, um, you know, and, and what that is and how that, how that works and how, how much freedom we're allowed to take for ourselves, you let's, know, or, you let's, know. sorry to cut you off. Yeah, yeah. Let's just for the second, let's keep it to you. Like, yeah. what is freedom? What did it look like when you were the kid growing up in right. the West versus what does it look like and feel like now? And maybe if you might, if you could, connected to the trip that you're about to take. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a huge part of it. That's exactly what the trip is. It's like, <laughs> well, quick story about that. So, um, and by the way, with anybody listening, I will normally not be that directive in an essay session, <laughs> but I just suddenly saw all these connections and it was like, ding, 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 ding. So counselor mine went off. So yeah, said, do with it what you will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean the, so we're going to rent our house for a year, um, which basically you know, is a, is a way of compelling ourselves to be on the road for a year. However, my mind wants to be on the road for as long as we want to be on the road, wow. you know, where, the, and who knows, maybe that's, I mean, maybe we get out and we're out there for two weeks and we're like, yeah, you know what, this isn't working. So we better go home and figure something else out. Um, I don't think that's the way it's going to go, but I'm, I'm open to that. Um, alternately, maybe we'll just stay on the road, you know, mm-hmm. if it's working and we like um, having sort of geographical freedom, maybe we'll just keep cruising around and, and, and stop in places. You know what I mean? And like hang out for a while. Um, you know, I really want to be in Maine in September. Cool. You know, yeah, it's like, I want, I want, uh, changing colors of the leaves. I want freaking lobster. Um, yeah. you know, and that's just a starting point. Right. And then it's like, well, what do we do in Maine? Okay. Yeah. Connect yeah. me to the why. Yeah, like, yeah. What is this on a deeper level that you said this is about, or I, I'm making up because you mentioned freedom and you said there might be a connection here. What, you said, in fact, when, you know, initially when we started this conversation, I said, what, why this trip? And you went to, you know, for me, the challenge that this came from is growing up gay in the Midwest. Help, help me make that connection. And it's, I'm asking, it sounds yeah. like I'm asking for like a really direct connection, but I'd just be curious if there's anything that you're noticing about that. Like why therefore then a trip you yeah. know, to, to go wherever? Well, you know, it's funny. Yeah, that's that's good. I the the other word that popped out on and this is a I'm looking at a list of probably I don't know seventy five terms, um, <laughs> and two only, I've only read two so far. Yeah, my, okay. my brain has only seen two of them. Um, and the other one besides freedom is courage, mm. um, and I think that's that that really resonates in terms of this trip where um, it's an expression of 
um, like having the bravery to, you know, do something unconventional mm-hmm. and make it work. And I think that's like, it's, it's kind of a response or, or, or a, you know, I'm like a parallel response to having grown up gay, you know, and having to, you know, filter and, and, and in some ways repress that, mm-hmm. um, definitely repress. I definitely did when I was a kid, um, that this is my way of being like, Hey, you know what? I've learned that it's okay for me to do crazy ass things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can make it work and I'm not like most other people. So, um, the, you know, this, maybe this will come as a surprise to you. Maybe it won't, but, um, I'm, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to make it work. And, and, uh, if you along our route of exploring, want to have a cup of tea with me, I'd love to do that, you know? Um, and that's just the, I don't know that that's the, that's the feeling I get. It's like a, it's, it's a, it's a courageous response to a unique challenge. You yeah. know, I'm really good at it. As, as you said, I mean, even that last thing you said about if you want to, uh, you know, join me for a cup of tea. Like there's that openness to connection and the, again, back to connection of yeah. just that that's like a deep desire that in some ways was met, but you're continuing, continuing to fulfill that desire yeah. in new ways. Well, yeah. I mean that, yeah, that's funny. That line. Yeah. I, I love, I love when the details turn into like the main idea, you know what I mean? Right. Um, because it, it really that it's, it's simple as that. If you're, if you're open to me, you know, and if you want to have a conversation with me, I'd love to have a conversation with you. You know, I, I almost, I would almost say no to, I don't, I don't want to say no to anybody, you know, I'd be happy to talk to just about, no, everybody, you know? So, um, Anyway, that's your invitation. Will the Stegosaurus come with you on the road, or is the Stegosaurus staying home? Well, we've got 60 square feet. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, bringing the podcast gear, so I, was, I will still be out there uh, recording. But yeah. uh, um, I think it's, it'll be, yeah, books, laptop, <laughs> clothes, bicycle, um, more essence objects, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Right. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. What do I? Well, that's the other thing. Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm like, no. just, I'm, I'm enjoying Go. talking about myself quite a bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, I'm not a stuff person. I'm not like a things person. I don't have. Um, I don't really have. I've got like my one beauty product, which is the thing that keeps my curls from um, turning into a total afro, um, and that's it. You know. Um, so. I'm excited for that too. I'm excited to like leave a lot of stuff behind. Um, not because I hate this stuff, but just because I don't need it. Yeah. Um, and it'll be fun to be sort of, you know, free and easy and having, having more experiences than physical things. Right. You know? it's, it's the experiences that we're, we're definitely after. Right. I'm yeah. getting more core values. <laughs> um, thank you. Thanks for being willing to just dive into that. I how hope was it was that? interesting. I hope it was, I, I, uh, well, how was it for you? Um, it was good. It was good. It was, uh, le- I think in some ways I would say I, I'm sure I could go to a scarier place. It wasn't, I mean, and it wasn't like I was not vulnerable there. I was vulnerable. And I, it, this is the stuff I'm thinking about so much that I think in some ways, like I didn't come in pre-planned at all, but I think, um, <laughs> maybe the challenge of having a microphone in front of me would, you know, makes it so I wouldn't go to like a really scary place. Yeah. Um, I don't think I have that many really scary places, but, uh, um, it, fe- it, it felt honest, which is, you know, a core value of mine. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll do another session off, Mike. <laughs> okay. Well, I just, I just want to say, like, I feel closer to you. I feel more connected to you. I feel grateful that you let us in a little bit because I feel, I feel in. I feel like you, mm. like, I feel a little bit inside your head, inside your heart, and mm. I feel like I um, know you a little more. And um, so thanks. Oh, I, well, I appreciate it. I appreciate you asking me these questions. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to check out the show notes at collegeessayguide.com slash podcast. And don't forget to check out part two of this episode where Ted gets into some really practical tips for how to improve your ACT score in 20 minutes. You can find that on the website. And uh, that's what I got. Stay curious. Stay curious.